How do you know when to use spinners versus cranks? Do you look at the position of fish or water temperature? Position of fish, that it has no bearing on anything. Water temperature would be one. Um, time of the year, you know, um, and, and again, Something what are you... Just try. <laughs> well, again, what are you, what are you trying to target? Big fish? Eater fish? I mean, it's, it's... It, the only thing I would say is I do, when you say look at the position of the fish, I would say for me that does come into play here, and I think it does for you too if you think about it. Let's say late May, the fish, you're in 30 feet of water and the fish are 25 to 28 feet down or something. I personally am going to pull spinners slow. 100%. Because it would, yes, you can snap away to crankbait down there, but there's so much line. I'm going to be through the fish. Generally speaking, you get a lot of pockets of fish there. Like if you have little areas, I'm going to fish slower. I don't want to go through at Mach 10. So, um, but again, it's so easy that me and you both at, you know, those times of year, I've got a set of spinners already pre-rigged up on, the, on those lighter rods and I've got my crankbaits rigged up and I'll just put them in the rod box, grab the other ones, and I make make one pass if I don't have success, I'm not going to put I mean, spinners in the next one. But we don't have to put them in the rod box, we can lay them on our front deck. Big deck on the Ranger 622. Yeah, there yeah, you go. Boy. Exactly. Okay. Um, if you can achieve the same depth for where the fish are, do you prefer jets or dipsies and why? I prefer not to use them and won't. <laughs> So the answer is move on to the next question. Uh, I'm going to give them a simple answer on that. This is like saying, do you want, again, do you want a screwdriver or a wrench? Jets float, dipsies sink. So run jets on your boards and run dipsies on the inside so that you can cover, a, you know, that same water. But when you turn or whatever, those, those jets are going to float up. So you're going to actually be covering different portions of the water column without having tangles. So jets boards, dipsies on the inside, run settings, you know, zero two or three or something or you're gonna cover that whole water column get in my boat i don't carry them <laughs> you've been burnt by those two but i'm not gonna keep going on that how do you determine the break line of pre-spawn versus post-spawn well here's the deal on lake erie kind of like red fishing that we're doing today yeah those redfish spawn two three times a year they're thinking right Walleyes aren't spawning two or three times a year, but what they are doing is, is on Lake Erie, it's like a revolving door. So they're not all spawning at the same time. Correct. So we may have pre-spawn, post-spawn, and spawning fish, depending on where you're at on the lake, all at the same time, where they're at kind of on There's, the conveyor I mean, belt. Are they coming in? There's three, probably three different phases. You get the really big, big mamas that come in March, early March, depending on the weather. And then you get the next class and then i mean that's yes no yeah ultimately i don't care like in the question like i, I what's it matter um i mean as long as you know post-spawn fish are probably lower in the water column pre-spawn fish are probably higher in the water column but we've debunked that many times together as well spawning fish are going to be right up in the spawning areas which is not necessarily just rock piles on lake erie it's some of the harder bottom bays it's shoals it's Detroit River, there's a million things, but I guess the bigger I mean, question would be who cares? Um, to me, it's not really, really a time. Yeah, so. and I, I've caught fish that are literally milking, and then I've caught fish full of eggs. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then I've caught an empty one all in the same pass, like an open water trolling. So I, I wouldn't worry about what phase they're in too much if it was me. Why don't you enter tournaments? Have you ever? We fish tournaments together. <laughs> yeah, he has. I fished enough to talk about it. How about that? I've had I've had some actually really good success in the tournament thing early in my career. If I didn't, maybe I'm not sitting here or, or have some of the situations I do. I think there's just a lot of underlying things with the tournaments that upsets you. Well, it's a bad business decision, number well, one. Well, yeah, because you're giving up, you know, five to seven days of guiding to go try to catch the big prize that everybody else is. So it's gambling. It's that, and it's also just, you know, a lot of what we do, as you know, because you help with that a lot. You drive a lot of camera boats and things yeah. for me, and we do a lot of content producing all these podcasts. It takes time. So it's just like anything else. To make that commitment, we're going after the most impressions or, or helping our partners the most. And unfortunately, tournaments <laughs> don't have the numbers. Correct. And the other thing is, 
Sponsors don't care about tournament fishing. Period. They don't care what place you're in. They care about movement of their product and coverage of the product. Hence, shows. Country Steve. All, so, all, all tournament guys learn. They don't care where you place. They care about making money. Because tournaments, you know, like walleye tournaments, let's say there's like four on one tour. That's all they got for... Who's watching the tournaments? The guys that are in the tournaments, there's no other coverage for it because no one cares except for some bass. Sorry. Uh, yeah. It's true. The business it's is true. bad. The numbers are... It's a bad, bad business decision. Right. But I also I do have an issue, as you know, we shot podcast about this. I do have a major issue with the way things are run. Yes. I also have a major issue with how some of the enforcement is. You know, that walleye cheater thing was just uh, accountability. a sampling. Accountability. No one makes anybody accountable. But I'll also be the first one to say I hope they get it figured out because while guys like me or Jason Mitchell or, I don't know, you could name a hundred of them, Jay Siemens, that's not a part of our program. A lot of these people that are whatever you want to call them media people are doing stuff you know we all had some of that at some Correct. point i think that healthy tournaments or a good recognition of you know not being the cheater scandals that we're having all that and it's in bass and everything else too it's everywhere but when you have a healthy thing with that i think it makes all of our jobs better oh 100 percent. that was that was very tactical countries too if you don't have a fish hog how would you determine how fast the current is can i answer this one <laughs> I have a fish hawk. It's still in the box. But you know what? You got one after the last <laughs> yeah. fall with Oh, me. yeah. Oh, yeah. When, so here's the deal. Do you want to try to use a sundial to determine what time it is, or do you want to look at a little nice display? And that's what you saw last fall where it's like yes. we were going one way, we were catching fish, it was flat calm, we spun back around, weren't catching anything, we looked down. I don't remember. It was four or five tenths difference in speed. It was. Because the current... It, it, it actually was more than that in a couple spots. Yeah. It was fun to watch and learn. I mean, you would go a half mile that way, and it would be off, you know, two tenths, three tenths. Because it's pocketed. And then you're going that way, the same way, but you just turned a little bit, and it was seven tenths, eight tenths. I mean, it was just way, way wicked. I drive off with a fish hawk no different than most people drive over their SOG. And when we were with Captain Chip shooting a little salmon clip, his uh, his <clears throat> speed on the ball was like, I think it was like 2.5 miles an hour, which is kind of where you want to be. But our SOG on the GPS up top was 1.3. Now, can you imagine a salmon boat, a 30-some foot boat, you're going 1.3? Like, you'd be like, no way. Right. So, I mean, get a fish hawk. You spend too much money on custom painting crankbaits that aren't doing you any good. You just need, like, chrome colors anyhow. For the most part, yeah. yeah. Get a fish hawk. It's it's impressive how many baits I carry or I used to carry that I don't need. How do you know the way to troll through the fish once you mark them at speed? I'm gonna tell you what I do. I always try to mark fish at speed going into the waves or into the current. And that way, that way, when I see them, then I can spin around and come back through them because I want to try to, generally speaking, troll with the current. Yes, correct. So that kind of goes back to the old fish hawk thing a little bit. But there are exceptions to that, but I think day in and day out, if you do that, you're going to be good most of the time. And it's more efficient. So You have way better boat control. Yeah, yeah. Can you get Joe Cermelli on your podcast... Um, Dude, even you know Joe Smurley's already been on our podcast. Where are you guys at? No wonder you can't find fish. Maybe you should just like, you know, use the search feature or something. Can you imagine that? They wonder why they can't find fish. They can't even find our podcast. Or Joe. Oh, Joe. Poor Joe. Country I like Joe. Joe. He is a lot of fun. How about more in-depth on props, such as three-blade versus four-blade, differences, pitch, etc.? What do you want to know? That's going to go upon horsepower, weight of the boat, aluminum versus fiberglass. I mean, it, so I'm, I'm yeah, 100 percent. You know, stainless. You, I would tell you to put stainless steel on anything because over it, 150. It, yeah, because of the flex. 
Yeah, over 150 horse, most times you're going to want stainless steel prop, as Country said. So a three blade is going to give you, generally speaking, more speed. A four blade is going to give you better grip, turning, hole shot, okay, because you got more things in there, but you're going to lose some overall. You need to use, go on the Mercury Prop Selector. They have an amazing little kind of app thing, if you will, and it's going to allow you to calculate your prop slippage, and that's huge because you may, you know, just need to be able to change your pitch or your size a little bit. Um, as far as pitch differences, here's one you may not even know, and especially you guys with the jack plates. When you go up or down one inch on your jack plate, or your mounting holes if you have it hard mounted on your boat that will actually change that essentially transforms that pitch of that prop like from a 17 to a 19 as an example did you know that no so yeah you're basically if you were to keep going down you're going to change and, and the big thing is that's going to change your rpms so ultimately when you're at wide open throttle you want to see what your what your rpms are and that way you're going to know if you need to go up or down in pitch but knowing that the, the angle or the height of your motor where that needs to be at the mounting location right is huge because you need to get kind of in the middle there. it's kind of like your transducer you got to kind of get rough in the game before you try to start fine tuning it right so there's a lot that goes on with props definitely check out mercury uh, marine they have an crazy amount of information which is what most guys use on though that's but, all we but use. for most walleye boats i would say uh, bigger walleye boats and heavier ones a four blade is probably where it's going to be at most of the time. Yeah, I use a um, on my current boats. I use a Rev Four. Yes. Series, and I know you've used. Um, God, what's the other one that you use? The uh, Bravo One. Yeah, I think that's about the best all around top for yeah. us. Bravo One's a good one. Yeah.